With hypospadius and epispadius, the prefix hypo means below, epi means above, and the suffix spadius refers to a slit or opening. So instead of having an opening at the tip of the urethra, hypospadius refers to an abnormal opening on the bottom of the urethra, and epispadius refers to an abnormal opening on the top of the urethra. And both of these can happen in boys and girls, but are way, way more common in boys. During genital development in the fetus, there's a point in the eighth week of gestation when both boys and girls have a similar bit of tissue called the genital tubercle, which normally grows in the cranial direction, meaning that it grows towards the head. After that point, in boys, the genital tubercle responds to the hormone dihydrotestosterone and stretches out a bit into a primitive phallus. As it grows in length, an area of tissue on the underside called the urethral plate invaginates to form a urethral groove, which is lined with epithelial cells. In the 14th week of gestation, the two urethral folds on the sides pinch off the groove to make it close, and form the penile urethra. In the 17th week of gestation, the ectodermal cells of the gland's penis, or head of the penis, also undergo a process of canalization, and the urethral canal connects with the penile canal, and that means that the urethra eventually meets the outside world at the tip of the penis. In a boy, hypospadias happens when the urethral folds along the penile urethra don't meet up and close properly, and that leaves an opening somewhere along the bottom of the penile shaft, and urine can leak out at that spot, instead of going out the tip of the penis like it should. Anatomically, hypospadias can happen in three areas. Glandular, which is near the head of the penis, mid-shaft, which is the middle of the penis, and penoscrotal, where the penis and scrotum come together. Generally, the least severe hypospadias are glandular, and the most severe are penoscrotal. Now, with regard to epispadias, the problem starts during the sixth week of gestation, when the genital tubercle grows in the posterior direction, towards the rectal area, instead of the cranial direction. In a boy, this results in an opening along the upper surface of the penis, and anatomically, epispadias can happen in three areas. Penopubic, where the base of the penis and the abdominal wall come together. Penile, which is just somewhere along the penis. And again, glandular, near the head of the penis. Generally, the least severe epispadias are glandular, and the most severe are penopubic. Alright, so switching gears to girls, during development, estrogens stimulate the development of the external genitalia. In this case, the genital tubercle only gets a little bit longer and then forms the clitoris. Here, the urethral folds and groove don't fuse, but instead create the labia minora and the vestibule. In the 13th week of gestation, the urethra forms and is situated anterior to the vagina and is shorter than the one in boys. Hypospadias results in the urethra opening into the anterior vaginal wall whereas epispadias results in the urethra developing too far anteriorly. Now, the precise cause of hypospadias and epispadias isn't fully understood, but seems to be related to fetal exposure to abnormal levels of androgens and estrogens. Of the two, hypospadias is more common, and they're associated with other conditions like cordy, which is when the penis has a hook shape and curves inwardly, inguinal hernia, which is a protrusion of bowel through the inguinal canal, and cryptorchidism, which is the absence of testes from the scrotum. Epispadias, on the other hand, are usually associated with bladder extrophy, where the bladder sticks out through the abdominal wall. And in females, they're often associated with a bifid clitoris, which is where the clitoris itself is divided into two parts. Symptoms of hypospadias and epispadias largely depends on the location of the abnormal urethral opening. In boys, the symptoms can range from making it slightly difficult to target the urine to incontinence. In girls, the diagnosis often happens later in life and can cause frequent and painful urination as well as recurrent urinary tract infections. As individuals mature, if the problem's left untreated, it can lead to sexual dysfunction, infertility, and psychosocial problems, especially in intimate relationships. The diagnosis of both hypospadias and epispadias is typically made when examining a newborn infant. Imaging studies like an excretory urogram can also be used to help with the diagnosis, 
and this is where a series of x-rays are used to visualize substances passing through the kidneys, the bladder, and the urethra. To treat both hypospadias and epispadias, surgery can be done to reconstruct the urethra, close up the defect, and allow urine to come out the tip of the urethra. This is usually done within the first two years of life. Sometimes hormone therapy can be useful as well, especially when there's an additional problem. For example, in a boy with a micropenis, which is an extremely small penis that results from low androgen levels during development. Finally, infants with hypospadias shouldn't have a circumcision, because the foreskin might be useful for future reconstruction. Alright, so as a quick recap, epispadias and hypospadias are generally seen in boys, although they can happen in both sexes. In boys with hypospadias, there's an abnormal opening on the underside of the penis. Worse with epispadias, there's an abnormal opening above or on top of the penis. Fortunately, both can be surgically corrected so that urine flows out the tip of the urethra. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.